future between uh, uh, technologies, uh, exploitation, and, uh, and uh, scientific um, uh, advancement between paths, uh, between autonomy and interdisciplinarity, between expertise and, uh, and cultural speculation. We only have to remember Sarah Whiting's uh, um, criticism of uh, the role of interdisciplinary uh, approaches in uh, queer culture that took place la last week here in, in this conference. Let's say that research, broadly speaking, um, uh, I would say in humanities and the science always based in three assumptions. First one is that we are able to detect a discipline as such. Um, and that discipline um, is more or less uh, acknowledged. And the second one is that um, we are able also to define the limits of that precise li discipline. And the third one, uh, the third assumption, sorry. And the third assumption is that um, we are able to push those limits uh, in a specific direction. We consider architecture as a cultural and aesthetic practice that, uh, I mean, no wonder that, uh, that the difficulties in architectural research and, and, uh, and what it entails um, are there. Moreover, there's a question in, uh, in the world of architecture, there's a question of uh, authority. Who uh, defines the discipline? Who defines the limits? And also about space. Where does research uh, has to take place? Mark Simmons, uh, uh, is Mark Simmons uh, runs, uh, uh, well, he's uh, the partner of Front, uh, uh, a facade uh, consultant office here based in New York. Probably applied research, uh, it's a discipline or it's a field where uh, 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 what research means, it's, uh, there's a larger consensus. We, um, Building facades probably represents physically and metaphorically those limits, and this is uh, where uh, uh, Mark Simmons is uh, uh, working. The attention that the last inches of the building have uh, been drawing in the last uh, past dec decade has been uh, enormous. It's not, um, uh, I mean, no wonder that uh, all the issues are concentrated in, in that specific space. Uh, that's the space for representation, that's the space for uh, uh, communication, that's the space for uh, 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 environmental concerns, and that's the space also for ecology. I, I'm, I assume that Mark Simmons uh, will talk a bit more about that. I would, that's why I would define the work of uh, Mark Simmons, or the main characteristic of the work of, uh, of uh, uh, Front, as uh, uh, with the condition of in betweenness, in between exterior and interior, in between the uh, uh, architectural desk and the construction site, in between uh, scientific uh, uh, innovation and technological. Technological um, uh, uh, expertise, and of course between uh, the utopian imagination of architecture culture and its material possibilities. Mark Simmons uh, graduated uh, from uh, Waterloo uh, University in Canada with a bachelor in um, um, environmental studies and also a professional bachelor in architecture. He uh, was working in different cities in Toronto, Hong Kong, uh, Tokyo, and New York. Um, he has been working for offices such as uh, um, Kim Takamatsu, um, Foster, uh, Foster, Foster and Partners, um, Mind uh, Artifact Technology, and the Woods McFarlane and Partners before establishing his own uh, office in 2002. Uh, among the projects he has been involved in the last year, probably we'll find one of um, some of the most significant and outstanding uh, um, designs of the last uh, decades among them, the Seattle Public Library, and the CCTV in Beijing, and the Billy Center um, in Dallas by all of them by all May, the Walker Art Center by, by Cedric Numeron, um, the Toledo Museum by um, um, Fujima and Nishizawa, or the National Library and the National Opera in Greece by Renzo Piano. So please help me welcome in uh, Mark. Okay, right, we don't have a lot of time. That's my fault, I apologize. It's the uh, first time I've ever shown up with a laptop that was swept clean of any content. The, uh, the message should have been to um, uh, basically just talk for 30 minutes, but instead you guys have such incredible download speeds that I did manage to take four projects of content in the last 20 minutes. Of course, I was late on top of it. Um, and uh, so I'm actually going to show you images. And uh, it basically, it's CCTV um, uh, Yaz Island with asymptote uh, 
Lincoln Square Synagogue uh, with Setra Ruddy and um, a project that we did ourselves for um, LVMH. And that's a completely random selection because that's what could be downloaded. So we're going to work with it. Um, the, uh, the, 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 a bit about crunch, uh, quickly, is, uh, yeah, I guess, um, officially we're facade engineering consultants, um, but that's not really what we kind of decided to be in life. It wasn't our kind of definition of ourselves. All the principals are architects and engineers, um, trained as such, and, uh, have worked in different places around the world. And when we started, it was the intention of saying, like, we want to work on any project in, on any terms that we're competent to work at with friends uh, on nice things. So it sounds kind of very simple, but it's true. Um, and it raises the question of, you know, your aspirations of how you want to work and what you want to work on, and also your question of competency, which is what, what do you know how to do? Because if you don't know how to do it, then you're not going to be doing it for very long. Um, so when you're working in you know, the modern day and age, uh, we know it's uh, said all the time, it takes a cast of hundreds if not thousands of people to build these uh, buildings, whether they're good or bad. And um, you're just a tiny little part of it. So the question is, is how can you uh, participate? How can you influence uh, the process to some degree? How can you make it better and so forth? So we set out to build a multidisciplinary company and, and uh, I caution you to say that there's many corporations that are multidisciplinary involving thousands of disciplines often, uh, but very often um, you'll have a structural division or a mechanical division or a this division, and actually at those scales, it's hard to get people actually who are multidisciplinary to really work together day in and day out, um, and that's tricky. So, you know, we have a, a small office. Uh, we now have offices in, in, in New York and Hong Kong and Seattle and San Francisco. And those are small, but uh, most people are in New York. And we have about 40, 40 staff now, um, who are about half people with some kind of architectural background, half with some kind of engineering background. And the engineers, as you can imagine, are divided between people with structural background, fabrication background, automotive, you know, mechanical design, energy modeling, construction management. You know, so every individual has his own personal kind of skill set, and he just sits somewhere in the studio, and everyone begins to learn who those people are and what they know. And there's not a lot of hierarchy, of course, because my theory about hierarchy is, while hierarchy is very useful in terms of organizing resources, it's uh, the guy working for somebody else doesn't always get a chance to express the full diversity of what he actually knows, of course he knows. So it's, a, it's quite a tricky process to manage a team like that, but at the same time, if it's sort of self-organizing and self-provocative, people actually start to kind of bring their diverse skill sets to the table and interesting things come out of that. So uh, we work uh, generally by referral. Uh, people invite us to do things, um, which is great, but it also means we're not in control of what we do, but I'm not complaining about what we do. It's, um, it's a nice set of, this is the fastest uh, set of CCTV images you've ever seen. <laughs> I'm trying to save time. See, that's something you can't do with PowerPoint. It's one of the advantages of image viewers. So um, CCTV, uh, I'm just going to go into some work here. The, the building, I like it. Um, I just went to go see it two weeks ago. Uh, it's remarkable. The lights are on now. Uh, not on the one that burned down, though, which we did as well. It was a bad day. Um, but it's, it's actually interesting in retrospect to be, uh, as they say, have a front row experience on history with one of the most spectacular, if not um, unfortunate, building fires in history, because it really was one of my favorite buildings in some ways. We like that guy more than this one. Um, but it's being rebuilt. It'll come back. Um, we're not in jail. We didn't do anything wrong. Um, the, uh, but CCTV is interesting, because it, it raises this question about performance, about aesthetics, about, uh, you know, uh, hubris, politics everything. You know, in all of the kind of um, characteristics of the envelope that were just described, the CS co-op with the expression there, um, is, is uh, security. You didn't mention security. No. Which is the original reason for the envelope, apart from noise. Um, but this thing is entirely defined by security. 
you know, all, um, all 51 stories of this building are blast resistant. And they're blast resistant because this comes on the heels of 9-11, was, uh, the competition was won only you know, just a year afterwards, so there's obviously some sensitivity to these issues. Um, and uh, it may not be reasonable to make all 51 stories blast resistant, but the question is, is for the same reason why a client is irresponsible enough to blow up one of their own buildings with class A fireworks with magnesium reagent in the fireworks, uh, which burns at 4,000 degrees Celsius, which by the way is almost tantamount to launching a space shuttle off the top of your building, um, is an interesting problem where Arab security produced a report basically putting forward the various levels of security mitigation for the envelope. So who in CCTV is going to make a decision to take a level of security lower than the top level? Right? I mean, you'd think it was a rational process. It was not rational. Uh, I can say this because the thing was protected up the wazoo, you know, which is great. But it's overprotected in our view. I mean, the level of protection is so overspecified that it actually becomes the defining experience of its own construction and aesthetics. So we have in this building um, a one million square foot overhang, which is permanently subjected, obviously, to gravity and then to wind and then to seismic forces, which in Beijing are fairly sizable. And when you have that permanent eccentricity, um, I'm not sure if uh, Rory McGowan or one of these guys have been here to talk about the structure of CCTV, but you know, there's elements in the building, columnar elements, which are permanently in tension. It's crazy. And there's braces that have loads that are almost in the same order of magnitude as columns. But because of the requirement for the building to move in a ductile way, the columns could be concrete and cave to protect them. However, the braces could not be. And if anyone saw this building at the competition stage, you may remember images where there is a diagrid on the inside, which is structural, but the curtain wall is actually just a completely rectangular grid. There was actually no representation of the structural grid on the facade originally. It actually came later. And it came later not as some sort of like Rem's uh, aesthetic obsession with uh, quoting the Bank of China or the Hancock Tower, uh, which was later on points of reference. Um, it was because the facade had to become a sacrificial blast screen to protect the diagonal braces of the building. So um, let, me, let me dwell on this image for a minute. Let's see, maybe this one's good. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, um, so what you're looking at here is a two-story spanning diagonal facade steel member superimposed onto the actual structural steel here. So these are the columns at a six degree angle and they have a concrete encasement. And then you have these nodes and the nodes, the structural grain of the primary building happens every two stories. It's a very specific thing to this building because of its scale. And one thing that a lot of people wouldn't appreciate is that every second floor in the building is what we call a diaphragm floor alternating with a non-diaphragm floor. So obviously that's a diaphragm floor and that's a non-diaphragm floor. In this sketch here, they're shown the same, but in actuality they're not. The non-diaphragm floors are very thin and they're coked in and around all of the braces and the whole building moves laterally completely differently from uh, every intermediate floor. So what happens when this building begins to move under an earthquake or under uh, uh, wind, you, every second floor is being left behind. I mean, they're actually doing this. And no building traditionally does that. And that was just that was just the fallout of the structural design. So the envelope now had two things. It had to attach itself to a structure that it couldn't attach to under normal conditions. And secondly, it had to protect the structure that was moving bizarrely. So what we did, and this is a first of its kind, no one's ever done this before, there may be things that are like it, uh, but that is a 
800 millimeter wide, 200 millimeter deep piece of steel that spans 13 meters on a diagonal connected to the primary building. And in behind it is a 350 millimeter crumple zone that when the blast event hits this facade, it actually then crumples and yields without putting an in-plane force into the diagonal struts. Because those diagonal struts have so much force in them that if they got hit by a blast load on the side, they would immediately kick out. In fact, Arabs was just like, there's no way around it. Like, if you have a security requirement applied to this building geometry in this geographic location at this height, you don't have a choice. This is what you have to do. So this isn't the Hearst, which I like, but I mean, it's not a tin can applied to a unified curtain wall. I mean, when you see Hearst going up, the panels go up, bang, 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 and then the tin cans get applied afterwards as a kind of representation of the structure. This thing is actually a two-petrol functional blast screen. It's very different. But ironically, when we all started to look formally and aesthetically at how this thing should be represented, there was a kind of ironic pleasure in dematerializing its structural role. And we actually, in a way, in intentionally turned it into its own kind of meta-representation of the structure, uh, structural forces of the building, but that's actually not why it's there. And we did that by recessing it. So there's big pictures of Bank of China and the Hancock and every other diagrid building on the wall in the studio in Rotterdam. And everyone's like, yeah, let's push it in. That's kind of fun. So all the models eventually started looking at this dematerialized set of diamonds of glass floating out in space, seemingly totally disconnected. And the whole design team really liked that because it actually reinforced the fact that structurally these diamond-shaped facades were actually discontinuous. And they had to be discontinuous because there was such a robust piece of steel separating it that it no longer had the logic of the curtain wall. So when I um, look at this thing here now, the mullions are all steel. And on top of the steel is a unitized curtain wall. And the steel is there, combined with the vertical mullions and the horizontals, to create a diaphragm. So the diaphragm is locked up in plane which we never do in a curtain wall. Usually you make all the panels breathe. This does exactly the opposite. We create a local structural diaphragm and we hang it. So this entire diaphragm of steel is hung from those diagrid elements and we have a giant massive stack joint down at the bottom. And the reason we do that is because every second floor behind, as I mentioned, is moving differentially. So all the wind load connections, which are providing wind load resistance perpendicular to the wall, are all slip both vertically and horizontally. And there are areas in the building when you start going up into the grid that are like nine story diamonds that are actually all hung. It's all hung. And it's very, very unusual. And frankly, almost no one knows any of this. Because from a security standpoint, you can't just go out and publish it. So there's a different story, there's a different narrative that gets told about what the project is and why it is. So you heard it here. Um, anyway, so here's a kind of uh, quick build up. You know, you've got the structure with the diagrids and then the concrete protection and then the cladding goes up. And then there's the diagrid elements here. These are pretty early sketches. And this shows the installation sequence. And one of the weird things is, is the mullions going in top down. And when you actually see the construction photographs, you're like, hmm, mullions top down. While it was expensive for a curtain wall in China, no matter how you cut it, the installation sequence was actually extraordinarily flexible because really you could put up anything in any sequence unlike a typical curtain wall. So it actually had huge advantages when it came to actually cladding the building. So this is the technical performance mock-up, which is 18 meters by 23 meters. Um, you can see the corner. This, this thing is like something that we all loved and fetishized and enjoyed and you, know, and you don't see that in many buildings. It's this kind of hyper-expressive thing knowing that the thing behind there, while it's really just a giant glorified reveal at the scale of the building, is actually extraordinarily robust. This is the seismic racking mock-up. This is the full-scale structural load mock-up. These are all the fricted glass mock-ups. What you're looking at here is the curtain wall inside the mock-up, so you can see it's actually a 200 millimeter deep, off-the-shelf, totally bog-standard steel section 
and then that is the unitized curtain wall. And for anyone who knows about unitized curtain walls, this is a classic brain joint pressure, equali pressure equalized unitized curtain wall that has all of the gubbins as we describe it uh, to make that work, but without any of the structural strength. So we stripped the mullion right down and basically made it very small and then hung it onto a steel backup that has intermittent support. So you can actually see here the little sh the highlights of those bolts. That's actually the connection intermittently for the curtain wall, which is also very unusual. And so you can, we like this. So that piece of steel there, I mean, you would assume, you can see the punchline coming, you'd assume that that's primary structure. There's no chance. That's facade steel. And I've never seen a curtain wall like that before. That's absurd. So there's the first primary, uh, fr that's the primary stone behind, and here's the first facade steel members going up. And then this is an enjoyable light like, because it tells us. You can see the kind of uh, nesting around here. So that's a non-diaphragm floor. It is very, very different. That's a diaphragm floor. And these brackets here connected onto the butterfly on the steel are the only points where those diagonal chevrons connect to the primary building structure. And those are specifically engineered to take all the blast loads into the building. And here you can see the um, chevrons going up, and then we have the mullions being installed top down, segment by segment by segment. And then as we race up the building. Uh, for those of you who are into non-standard geometry, it's just a bit of trivia that about 65% of all of the glass panels on the building are unique because of the interface of the grid with the offcut geometry. By the time you count up all the panels, that's what you get. Anyway, so then this is just like rooms of construction sequence and photographs and a few gorgeous completion photographs by our friend Ivan Fong. It's too many. But these ones are good. And then as many of you may know, the oculus at the top there, the windows, the walk-on glass floors that you go on, you look down onto the garden, and the garden is like basically a vegetated map of a nowhere map for whatever reason. Okay, let's, uh, yeah, let me skip that one. Okay, so this is um, our friends, Hani Rashid and Rehan Couture, and we were working with them on a number of things in the Middle East, um, most of which didn't get built, and this one did get built. And it got built under very kind of um, odd circumstances. Uh, for anyone who's read the story of the project, uh, there was a planned hotel here, and the architect got fired, and the Sheikh came in and said, actually, look, I really want something iconic. They had a mini competition. Azimtote won, uh, so the developer is Aldar, and the contractor is Aldar Lango Work, which is an important fact. And the, uh, the, the unbelievable thing, once the competition was won, is Hani and Rizan put us all in a room and said, okay, this is a team, and you guys, we have 22 months to build a one million square foot ground scraper. And that's including the entire design phase. That's not the construction phase. So that's actually the kind of biggest story of this project. I mean, formally, you can take it or leave it. But it, it, to, to actually achieve this was something we hadn't quite experienced before. CCTV is big and complex, but this thing is about velocity. And it's also about a kind of process because uh, once you can imagine you can actually build a building like this in 22 months, uh, the reasons in the future why people won't do it are not very good. People are going to say, hey, money's expensive, I'm going to borrow funds, why can't I have a building like this in 22 months? So there's this kind of you know, question about how do you do this? Well, what you do is you take the entire construction schedule and you superimpose it on top of the design schedule because they're both about the same. And then you start saying, okay, well, what decisions do I have to make and what kind of a team do I need um, in place working together to make those kinds of decisions? And that's what we did. Um, so Eldar Lango Rourke was the general contractor who came to the table and they said, look, you know, we've got to build this thing. And they asked the design team, which subcontractors need to be in place now? And we said, well, we're going to have a grid shell because that was part of the competition, which was this thing. 
and uh, everyone agreed that Wagner Biro from Austria was the best contractor for the job, and they were appointed. Bang. They were at the next workshop. That never happens on a project. The fact that someone would have the confidence to know who the right person is and have the tr trust to go into negotiated contracts with them in a fast-track environment. Uh, does happen sometimes in other places, um, but it's not that common. So then, uh, about two months into the job, we decided that Gartner, Permis de Lisa, should be the curtain wall contractor. And piece of trivia for anyone who doesn't know Permis de Lisa, they're the second largest curtain wall contractor in the world, just was acquired by the Japanese. Um, the, the process here was also so complex that um, we uh, discussed with Hani the benefit of having a full building infra information model using CATIA, and they had already started to gear it up a little bit. Um, so we got um, GT, Greater Technologies, on the job as an information model management group, and then a series of other structural engineers. We had Tilki uh, doing base building civil work. We had um, uh, Arup Engineering doing the bridge structure between the two buildings. We had Schleich Bergerman doing the steel structure of the grid shell. Uh, we had a specialty wind tunnel consultant on from day one. Um, anyway, so there's this kind of like, uh, the moral of the story is this kind of team building approach saying, from first principles, who's the client, what do you want to build, what are the terms, and then who are the people you actually need to put this in place? And then just accept that, okay, well, you know, there's almost like a peer review of each person as you kind of bring them into the group, uh, and then there's an acceptance that that's the team. For example, even with the some small components that had to be prototyped and manufactured and uh, Billings Jackson, uh, the former industrial design group of Grimshaw got involved, you know, to handle that component of the work. And then Arab Lighting, Brian Stacy in New York got involved to handle his piece and then he brought an industrial designer named Tommy Vooten in to design the actual components and to prototype those and fast track that. So you can see this whole kind of like network of people all working under Hani and Luzan's direction to make this thing sort of happen. So in the end, I mean, you guys being Columbia here are all very familiar with uh, questions of geometrical optimization and so forth, and lots of questions about how to optimize these grid shells um, and the panels that go in them. The, the first instinct of the owners was to lay down the law and say something like, you know, you can't have more than 20 panels. Uh, we just all thought that was completely absurd. So we tried doing an instantiation of 20 panels across the grid shell, and it looked horrendous. There was no way we were going to do it. Um, this image is funny because we used to have uh, motorization of all the panels. They all used to move and tilt until the owner discovered that we had to have a cooling fan inside of every single node across 5,000 panels, and then they said no. Um, the, 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 the fact that we're going to have 5,000 unique panels emerged, I wouldn't say early, but kind of medium in the process. And we basically just held the, held the fort, Henry held the fort on them, just said, like, it's going to be unique. So we've got to find some other way to optimize these panels. Now, it's, it's both a benefit from a manufacturing standpoint to have these things curved, and it's also a benefit um, aesthetically. Of course, we wanted them to be radius. But what happens if you radius them all with the exact same radius on the corners and then force every one of those to an integer angle? You then get a kind of standard deviation of various pieces of a certain uh, angle. So you might have like you know 400 pieces at 34 degrees and 500 pieces at 35 degrees, and you can start actually standardizing these kind of corner part donuts. And uh, there's also a, a question about how you make these things. Um, in the traditional curtain wall industry, we would just put in a, a mullion. Uh, in a, a splice block, we'd silicone it, we'd put in a screw on the other side, and we'd lock it all together. But because these things are completely external and outside, we said they really need to be sealed. They really need to be welded up. And what was very interesting for us um, is I think if we were working for almost any curtain wall contractor or with a curtain wall contractor, they would not want to weld these panels. It's outside the realm of normal curtain wall practice. But Wagner Bureau, being a grid shell contractor who took on the scope of the aluminum work, said, hey, we have nothing but welders on staff, and we can weld aluminum. That's not a problem. Um, and if you are curious, trying to weld cast aluminum to extruded aluminum is a very bad uh, thing. It's not going to work very well. 
but what we all kind of discovered together was um, welding forged aluminum to extruded aluminum works. And it's also cheaper. So eventually we, we got to a point of um, being able to make, uh, I'm just gonna raise forward here. And maybe we'll have very compelling images, but to this sort of thing here. So here we have a standard panel. Actually this drawing describes every single panel on the job. It's tied into a spreadsheet and then it all basically drives through because it's actually very simple. So here, this is real money. The, this is basically the forging. And because we rationalize the panel sizes into four frame sizes, the panels themselves are all unique, but the, the sizes of them go range from like 1.5 meters up to five meters. So the frame that they sit on, of course, is all optimized. So that was rationalized into four groups. So that means there's four different radiuses of donuts, which are these forged end panels. And then these get CNC milled into the four different kind of corners of these things. And then they get uh, basically milled down to accept the weldment. They have the, uh, basically a point for the strut to be screwed in, milled into the end. And then they get jigged up on a table, welded, ground smooth, and painted. So they actually feel like a completely monolithic, almost like a uh, FRP kind of construction. The, um, the whole team, I might add, also was um, making parts in Katia in real time during the process. So someone else was modeling structure in Katia and Doug Bergman and those guys were modeling grid shells in Katia. We were modeling all the facade components in Katia and then he, GT was basically taking all those components, instantiating them across and then uh, basically reconciling all the geometry. The geometry was then being exported out to the various subcontractors and then uh, BT took a subcontract on the contractor side of the table to do construction sequence modeling in order to optimize the erection of the whole grid shell system as it was going. I think we've hit about 5.30. I'm gonna skip the other two projects and maybe stop there. So um, I don't really have any closing remarks prepared, uh, but I, I would maybe emphasize that for us, um, Every single project that comes in the door, we are interested in the client. We're not initially interested in the formal agenda. And with the client, it's a question of the fundamental raison d'etre why we build. It's a, the client represents a set of values, it represents a, a culture, it represents a set of needs and capabilities, and it also, very importantly, has an aggregation of resources which in this world is required to build. And so we're gonna be working with them as part of their team to realize their agenda. If there's an architect on board, and sometimes there isn't, uh, you know, that whole team who we put together, we, we kind of psychologically take it out of the context of corporatism. You know, there's a way to say, oh, all these people need to be there and these are all the established companies. But if you just strip it all back and say, really, what skill sets do we need to realize that set of ambitions that that client has in that particular place for whatever reasons? and then start to inhabit the problem from that point. And that's what we do every single day. And that's why I think we have a, such a diversity of work. And there's also a very kind of diverse set of technical solutions. We're not dogmatic. We don't have a particular view of how something should be made. I don't care. It's not for me a moral issue, whether it's like a thousand guys in China or India assembling something by hand. And I don't care if it's all crane installed union labor in New York City. Uh, for me, it's immaterial. It's a question of like, what do we want to build? What's the best and most intelligent, responsible way to get there? Thanks.
is the notion of things like uh, uh, the figure of the architect is totally diminished aside from the iconic value that uh, perhaps might be able to um, um, present in, in the design. But I was wondering, um, how do you articulate the relationship with the different design practices and which one is your role in the design and uh, in at the very earliest stage of the, of the, uh, of the building process? Hmm. Sorry, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> forgive me if I was diminishing the role of the architect. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to wrestle with that. Um, well, my my view of the architect, first of all, is that there's no, you know, there, I'm I'm trained as an architect. Uh, I've, I've been sitting on my authorization to write my licensure now for 12 years, and uh, I decided to start a company instead. So um, the definition of what an architect is, I mean, I, I consider myself an architect and do architecture every day. Um, the question of authorship um, is not an irrelevant question. Um, and we all know architects are made completely differently with different skill sets and so forth. Uh, and I think, well, well my, my point of view is really that the world is just so, so wildly complex and blended uh, with kind of gradients of reality that it's just not worth trying to generalize. But what I, what I can say though for sure is that, and this is actually what my seminar at Princeton really is about, is that there is nobody else in the process except for the architect that will take a uh, a defining leadership role and to serve as a catalyst to bring these projects into being. And, and that's because of the education. There's actually no one else who can do it. Even if you have a very, very smart client, they can't do it. If you have a very, very capable owner representative, they can't do it. Even a great contractor can't do it. But the reality is, you know, when students come to my class, they, they, there's, it's clear that the range and complexity of issues on the table is so large that you will never get your head around it. You can't. You can't know everything. You will never owe everything. So the question is, is how, given that limitation, do you effectively contribute to something and actually make a difference, actually influence it? And that's, it's tricky because it is about the individual. It's actually about a kind of, uh, you know, will to power, if you will, because the individual matters. I mean, sejima is sejima. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if, if you don't have that poetic vision to push against, you don't have anything. I mean, Toledo didn't come out just because of a glass engineer said, oh, here's the detail. You know, if there wasn't resistance in the conception of the project, uh, then uh, there's nothing for the rest of the team to actually do. And then, then uh, and I think Arthur Lubau wrote about this, if the owner doesn't have the confidence in that vision or the backing of it, even if it's a kind of uh, conflictual relationship, if they don't if they don't back it, then that inevitable resistance you get from reality budget contractors, whatever it is, doesn't create a set of friction to yield a new result. You'll you'll end up defaulting to some sort of normative condition. So even architects, in a sense, for us, uh, we understand them and their power. Uh, culturally and and the ability to work together using that cultural leverage to achieve things that maybe aren't obvious. Not always, but it does help. So, you know, we were having all these discussions about uh, facades or, you know, just envelopes, stressing apparently me more the facade aspect because I thought it was, you know, something related with intersection between technical expertise and somehow a representation space. Actually, there was, coming back to the discussion, a, a very, what I thought was a very curious definition of uh, your work in debate that was, uh, if I'm not quoting you wrong, it was precision message delivery, somehow, no? for your work. It's 
something that assembles both the technical expertise and the communication mm -hmm. expertise. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's why that's so intense, that particular edge. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. I mean, I think for, for us anyway, obviously, given the role that we're assigned in the process, the technical competency is something that you almost have to take for granted. Like, if you don't have the ability, you can't play. <laughs> yes, but... It's the same thing with errors and omissions liability insurance. If you can't convince the insurance companies to give you $5 million in coverage, you can't play. So, what do you somehow contribute? Because, yeah, I, I had that assumption that liability was a major uh, question. So I mean, just, but it's very kind of tricky. Let's say, well, I'm selling responsibility here. No. Yeah, it's actually the perception of responsibility. There you go. As I said, it's a, it's a, it's a ticket. Okay. It's not actually, it's a prerequisite in order to sit at the table, but it's not actually what you're selling. Although my friends at Fosters um, often uh, have a derogatory term for uh, facade engineering consultants as liability magnets. Um, there's another uh, person uh, at Frank Gehry's office who, uh, this isn't slanderous, I shouldn't say this, but um, he doesn't work there anymore. Okay, that's my way out of it. He says facade consultants are pimps for contractors. Yes. <laughs> but you know what, the, the thing is, is when you get into the big corporate firms, okay, you talk about, you know, whatever, put them out there, SOM or something like that. And there is a kind of uh, legacy of competency within the firm where, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, these guys developed curtain walls. You know, they, that was their culture. That's where it all came from. And they still have people in the company that are extraordinarily competent, you know. So the whole idea of a consultant is moot because it's really just like, okay, you can do it. That's why I stress this question of competency and not company. Like, if you have a group of people, I don't care what umbrella they're under, what company they're assigned to, but if you have the skills at the table to solve a given problem, then just look around the table at who's there. Maybe they're working for different companies, you know, maybe not. You know, yeah. but, but if, you, if you combine Foster and Partners with Permis de Lisa, they can build any building in the world. It's not a question. Yes, but, but for instance, sorry, uh, the research problem. Because, of course, there was this, the 60s, there was a part of the 60s debate that the corporate office was the un, one that actually had the research muscle mm -hmm. to pull that particular thing. But yeah, but we all know the main problem, right? The main problem is still design, intelligence, creativity, provocative. I mean, you know, SOM, uh, bless their soul, can't produce what OMA produces because it's not OMA. I mean, they have a work culture which is about kind of creative destruction and reconstruction through a kind of creative process. And you know, maybe some of their buildings are not great, but others are, are so risky that eventually you get to an answer that you just could not have gotten to if you didn't take those risks. And that's where, you know, if OMA is, a, is an entity that now is quite large um, and really quite established, uh, they have made a decision really structurally within their firm not to build out a structural engineering division and a facade division. They could have. They could have done that over the years. But instead, they said, actually, well, there's lots of other people out there who are creative collaborators, and we're not the only facade consultant they work with. There's others. Um, and they've chosen a model of more free association between looser, smaller entities. Mm -hmm. And that's just a choice um, where, where our opportunity lies. You know, because if we're an independent company that has its own profit and loss and reputation and brand, then we can only work where we're needed. So there's certain environments globally where we're not needed or welcome. And there's certain areas where we're absolutely essential. And we can often be a big equalizer for small firms. You know, where a small firm was, you know, say five, 10 people trying to do something, we often now, because we're established enough ourselves, that they will use our name as leverage during a competition. They might have air up for 
you know, structural MEP and facade, but they might have error for structural MEP and then they have front for their facade. Just, which is, of course, a problem of representation, a problem of the appearance or the expectation of how these things generate market value. Which was well, it's because, things. you know, people who build buildings, like clients, they spend a lot of money and they do want the security to know that the people they're putting uh, the money in their hands of actually are going to spend it wisely. I hear architects whinging all the time about loss of control and power. I'm like, are you nuts? <laughs> like, you're, you're vying for a position. You're aspiring to a position where someone's giving you a $200 million check to build a building? Like, who else gets to spend that kind of money? My attorneys don't get to spend that kind of money. And we do. Even a facade contract can be 40, 50 million bucks. We could just sit there and draw this thing crazy and go out there, tender it, and like, you know. I mean, it's like better than having an Amex card with an unlimited spending limit. You know, if you think about the responsibility you face, and then it's got to work. It's got to work. Can we open it? I, um, w when Mies designed the ITP building, uh, you know, he would uh, draw these incredible details right onto the drawing details. So he never had to describe to the contractors uh, any type of um, any abstractions in his in his design, whereas I, I guess we're moving towards a tendency where architects are no longer designing this detail phase, but we're designing a much more broader sense. We describe the geometry, but we don't necessarily tell them the boat goes here, the you know the emollient goes here. We now de delegate these these uh, these functions to experts like you. So my question is, should as an architecture school teach students to just simply dis, you know, design the geometry or learn, learn the uh, nature of geometry, but just kind of delegate the role of these technical aspects to the experts or, or, special, or special contractors like Mark Simmons. Because I, cause we're learning Grasshopper now and my previous school taught us a uh, you know, project and it just seems it gets more and more convoluted. I, I, don't, I don't feel as an architect know more about the stru structure because I know more about the tools. I think it just simply is another tool that I have to learn because technology is changing. Yeah, the tools are a treadmill. It's tough. 80% of my work is done uh, with a black marker and a whiteboard. And I would encourage you all to do that. <laughs> Abandon Grasshopper and uh, <laughs> DP and, and especially Revit. Right, so, so would, you, would you want us to come with expertise? Would you want us to come with ex expertise and say, well, this is the grasshopper we're using now, and you should use it too? Or would you rather us just simply come up with the design? No, I, I, can't, I can't go there. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a digital apologist, actually. I'm, I'm very much a Luddite. I, no, I really believe in, like, again, I'm going to say it. I know it sounds dumb, but like, what do you want to build, and what's the smartest way to build it? What's the smartest way to describe it? I mean, you look at all the 2D drawings that Calatrava used to do, you know, just like, hand-drawn curve and then like a line and then multiple points that were measured and then some guy basically milled it out, you know, and incredibly complex geometries have been built throughout time. We don't need advanced tools to do it. It's just that advanced tools make it easier. And sometimes there's certain limits that we can hit where like you, like traditionally, okay, it would have taken you like maybe 20 years to build Yaz Island a uh, thousand years ago, but uh, with probably 50 times the labor force. So there's a question of efficiency. I'm not there sure there's a difference in resultant, however. Um, but the question about architects advocating or abdicating uh, design ability or technical knowledge, that's insane. That's insane. But as I say, only a gifted person can do everything. Like if you're a great communicator and you can draw really well and you're a DP genius and you're a scripting guru and you're at the same time able to draw like Carlos Scarpa, well, you know, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> right, and if you're as well read as these guys, and then you can write. But it's, uh, it's, it's not that easy and um, and that's why it always takes a team. So if anything, I would encourage you to learn how to work with other people and play nice. Um, my question is what's come out of Yaz? So post this,
kind of intense uh, time frame that created an intense collaboration and changed the construction design mm -hmm. process. Have those lessons um, been put forth to other projects? And you know, has Asymptote taken the lead in that, or they just have other pro architects sort of seen that and thought that's a good collaboration model? Well, I, I can't speak for Hanny and Lizanne because um, I think the, the you know, because they, they initially, I think, got pretty hit hard by the recession. Um, so I'm not quite sure what workload they have right now or how they're using their tools or what kind of um, a staff they have uh, currently. Um, but what I do know is they retain the core experience of what it takes to build and organize a team to deliver a project like that. And, and that's pretty wild as an asset because, you know, as the economy starts gearing up again, you know, they're going to be in a place where they can say, I know what that looks like and I know what it takes. Um, and there's very few practices that have that under their belt. So, you know, from 2007 to 2010, I think it was quite a transformative experience for their office. But for our office, um, uh, Yaz was an incremental step from somewhere where we were coming from and ended up being a stepping stone into a place where we are now. And, um, you know, you we've done uh, design build projects on the side uh, for fun, usually at a loss. Uh, like we built uh, Neil Denari's Highline 23 project uh, for about three and a half million dollars, all modeled in DP, made in China. And then there's a bunch of others. We've actually delivered about 13 um, design build jobs, uh, which has funded our core investment in technology at the mm. same time. Are you experiencing more projects where there is a greater initial take up of all consultants working together from the start in this more collaborative model or you're dealing yeah, with more traditional? Yeah, there's, um, well, there's a project we're working on right now. Um, it's, a, it's actually a charter school in Gowanus in Brooklyn. Um, where there's two charter schools that are leasing a space for 30 years and there's a developer who's going to build it and pay for it using those leases as the underlying financing model. Um, but the, re the deal is the charter school uh, wanted to be in by next September uh, and they're only putting piles in the ground right now. So it's super fast. So we said um, you cannot stick build. Like if you stick build, you basically got metal studs, sheathing, waterproofing, outboard insulation, outboard framing, exterior metal cladding, and interior finishing drywall, plus mudding, plus sanding, plus painting. That's like 10 processes inside and outside, all of which need to be scaffolded. And when you look at the time that the steel frame would be available, you'd only have four months to actually finish the building and hand it over. It is impossible. So we basically backed out of the schedule and said, okay, well, within five months of being awarded this design commission, and the architect is Claire Weiss and Mark Yeos of WXY, um, who are friends of ours, and they said, okay, Mark, this is a super fast track job, let's think creatively with the developer about how to do this, and we said, okay, so give us a contract to both do the structure, so we're doing the structure of the building, and we're working, we're not actually engineer record, because we can't do that, but we're working with Magnus and Clemensic, guys that did Seattle Library, so we brought them in and said, okay, you guys are the big guys here, but we'll coordinate the structure by building a BIM model of it, and we'll do the envelope. And then we'll panelize the whole envelope. We're gonna pre-skin the interior to the cladding and have the whole thing come as a unitized panel. And then we said, well, the owner wants it cheap. So we said, okay, China, Mexico, uh, and local New York installation. So if we fast track all of the design decisions to make sure every bracket is coordinated, every panel is as uniform as possible while still achieving the design intent, can we do that and actually buy the contract next month and have a fully fabricated 820 curtain wall panels, it's not a small building, arrive on site in New York in February and then hang 20 panels a day with the interior pre-finished. So this is kind of a lesson that came from things like Yaz and other projects and has given a kind of flexibility to the way we think and then if we can integrate our system design knowledge, our architectural collaboration knowledge, uh, plus engineering, and then the information modeling, but then leverage a global supply chain to help a developer deliver something ultra fast track to meet a commitment, that's pretty interesting. 
So that's kind of where we're at right now. Not to mention the fact that we're doing the Barclays Arena for better or for worse. We're generating, in case you didn't know, because mm -hmm. um, uh, shop doesn't like to talk about what we're contributing to the project. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, we worked for three and a half years with Gary Partners on the original scheme, and then that parted ways. And then we got brought in independently by Forrest Suki Ratner after L.B. Beckett got shamed by Nikolai Urasov in the New York Times to spend three months with Ratner um, reconceptualizing the envelope of the building and how you can invest in a new form of iconicity. And we actually modeled for them minimum surface schemes, triangulated schemes, and so forth. But unfortunately, Frank Gehry's facade consultant cannot be the new designer for the new Nets Arena. So um, David Childs brokered an introduction between shop architects and uh, Forest City Ratner. And we then joined the contracting team and we went at it for six months on a competitive bid because you know the job is being funded through at least $600 million of tax exempt state bonds. So it had to be competitively tendered for the facade. And then we figured out how to unitize the wall during the tender process. And so what we've done is we've owned the whole surface geometry, uh, unitized the whole thing. So we're doing, we have a multi-million dollar contract to do complete system design, structural engineering, uh, full shop drawings, which is about a thousand sheets of drawings, and complete CATIA modeling with full extraction for half a million unique components for fabrication. So Yaz led to us being on the other side of the table, actually producing directories, and we have automation routines, documentation templates, and so forth. We're so far along the food chain now that we're actually creating 15,000 components for fabrication every week. And it's working. It's, it's unbelievable. It's actually a total paradigm shift in how the industry can operate. Uh, you mentioned a couple of projects that are superficially kind of similar in CCTG, this expressing structure in the Highline project, and their execution is really different, obviously. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how much you consider yourself a facilitator of the architect's will, and how much you consider yourself an activist for the possible expressions within that facade. Well, I don't know. I mean, of course we're facilitators, enablers, collaborators. Um, do we author any of our projects uh, for our clients? No. Wouldn't be polite of me to say so anyway. I'm not sure if I hedge there, but. I, I had a question. Maybe. <laughs> to say that. Well, Cecil Belmont doesn't. <laughs> I had a question, and I, you could consider it a follow up question, which is what is your attitude to beauty? Because. To I duty? Beauty. Oh, beauty. Because I noticed that um, when you talked about the CCTV, you used words like unique and um, expressive. And so are you using those in the sense that architects often use those terms as of something beautiful? Or are those independent values for you? Yeah, beauty. <laughs> it's funny, um, one of the last thesis programs at Princeton was the theme word was beauty. And uh, it's pretty diverse. <laughs> I, I, I have a very diverse appreciation of the world. And I, <laughs> I, I've traveled a lot. I mean, I, I know I'm relatively young, but I, I think apart from, uh, apart from the horrors that we see in the world, the natural world is beautiful. And everything we produce, whether it's poorly built or wonderfully built, you know, beauty can be sublime, sometimes terrible, sometimes sugar-coated. You know, it's, I think for me, sometimes it's not about beauty per se, it's really about uh, the conviction of realization. Like in the end, if we're all alchemists and we live in this world to manipulate our built environment to something of our own making, what convictions and what abilities do you bring to the table? How well done is it? How smart is it? You know, to what degree does it impact others, either negatively or positively? I'm not a moralist, but. 
uh, that's a follow-up of a follow-up. Um, I, I, I was really surprised when you presented the, um, the CCTV making so much uh, kind of you, you mentioned all the time that the whole design was extremely functional. All the definition was all about, you know, this is receipt, people think it's a reference, people think it's about history of architecture. No, it's pure functionality. And, uh, well, it's not what I said. Well, you, 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 but you, you kind of imply it systematically, saying like, you know, this, you, they read it as a, you know, a reference to what there are other No, but what I said as well is there's a, there's a very deliberate, conscious, self-aware, almost iron ironical approach to the aesthetic. Was the, that was only half of the idea. Yeah, but, but, <laughs> but, okay, so but, I, but, so but, but how many architects would willfully uh, create some sort of representation of the structure and then willfully dematerialize it through its detail? I mean, it, it's, that's, that's a conversation. There's a lot of people involved in making that happen, and that's OMA. I mean, it's, it's, it's the whole team, but I mean, I just don't know that that conversation takes place in too many, well, it did, does not take place in corporate offices. So, so do you think that, that, but that, sorry, what was your question? Yeah, but so, so that, is that conversa conversation only feasible in a, a professional environment? Uh, because at the end, this session was kind of about um, research. And uh, assuming that the way you explain your practice with the kind of highly complex network of relationships with multiple partners, where kind of creativity and newness is is the is what is uh, what is the goal in a way uh, optimization of processes seems to define um, uh, research as something that has to happen in, in such environment and therefore um, do s do not belong in in places like this one uh, so like a school where it's, you know the en the enclosure and the way of working is more kind of focused and in a way kind of looking towards the discipline the way it works. And, uh, but at the same time, it's kind of paradoxical since historically, let's say, or for a long time, for other disciplines and I, even for architecture for a while, uh, places like this one uh, were the home of what is research. And universities tend, especially architectural universities, tend to describe themselves as a research units, think tanks, places where newness and creativity is uh, kind of uh, is the goal too. So do you, do you see yourself or like your definition of, of research or your work as a research part or kind of exclu exclusive uh, or could be included in, in, a, in a academic uh, environments? And if that, and I maybe explain how you conceptualize your position in Princeton in that regard. Hmm. Well, the pedagogical problem of trying to replicate real world constraints in school is not easily resolved. And I think it's such a problem that you shouldn't try. That's not to say you shouldn't have constraints in school, but the idea that you could achieve one of these projects uh, in school is a bit of a stretch. Um, I didn't show the Wiley Theater, but you know the Wiley. You know, we all knew that. Okay, there's a couple of basic moves: the stacked stage and the fly tower and the lobby. Okay, but we all said, okay, look, and it's a small building, and to hold ourselves urbanistically in that context and against the Foster Opera House across the street, we wanted height. So the massing evolved, the landscape evolved, that's the party, that's the diagram, and that's, that's a whole set of conceptions about the theater and about the city. And that's, that's kind of primal in a way to start with. Okay, so you can get there, but what you can't get to is that by the time you look at the original budget from the Dallas Center for the Performing Arts Foundation and you budget every part of the theater project and the structure of that mass, you end up with $28 a square foot for the envelope, right? And anyone who knows their budgets knows that that's basically a stucco wall. So what do you do? Well, we designed a stucco wall. Uh, it's part of the normal presentation, but we basically said, okay, uh, maybe that can be cool. 
uh, you know, 20 bucks a square foot, like stucco, okay? It's not kind of what we all imagined it would be. But why not? It was good enough for Los, you know? I mean, it's good enough for half the world in the tropical climates. So we said, okay, let's do the Dutch thing. We'll, we'll take the building and the glass portion and we'll pretend that it was dipped. And then it was like, okay, so if you're going to do stucco, then what can you do special to it? And, you know, the idea actually came from uh, the spray-on fireproofing on the soffit of the Seattle Library where mica particles got stuck into the black fireproofing. So it kind of sparkles a little bit. You can't see anything. It's just got a little bit of spangle to it. So he said, wouldn't it be nice to have a completely monolithic, sparkly stucco? And then we said, what would be nice is if it didn't have movement joints in it because the structure behind it is actually moving in all sorts of bizarre ways. There's like multi-story theaters and fly spaces and there's hangers and all sorts of things. And if you hang a wall onto a structure, you must telegraph through all of those displacements and movements into the exterior facade. So you're gonna end up having a series of control joints and stuff going through. And then the facade starts breaking down into this kind of large, almost representation of the movement joints of the primary structure. And we're like, oh God, that's awful. Like, so I always joke, contemporary architecture is a war on joints, and it really is. I mean, every stage of my building is all about joints, 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 it's all joints. Because joints are the inevitable indexical uh, reference to uh, what is normal, what is banal, what is economical. And the reason why every like glass-clad building in the suburbs that's four stories looks like crap is because it actually conforms to a very efficient economic metric of the efficiency of aluminum, the efficiency of glass production, the efficiency of labor rates, and how you can build a building quickly. So all those metrics conspire to make buildings the same. So subliminally, we don't understand that, but when you look at buildings, buildings seem banal and normative because often they are, right? So things that are somehow destroying that uh, become unusual to us, and we start to take, like, you know, pay attention to them. So what this yielded on the Wiley Theater was saying, okay, well, if we have to support the entire wall behind with metal studs, let's hang the studs, just cold form studs. And that idea actually came from CCTV, believe it or not. So this is kind of like this weird pollination of ideas. And so we said, let's just hang all the studs. We'll take out all the movement joints so the whole thing will move and just breathe sideways. And then we can cover the whole thing with stucco. And so we got stucco samples with microparticles. We did one in white, we did one in black, we liked it. But it wasn't enough. We really wanted it to look like it was dipped. We wanted it to look wet. And so we did research into various coatings and we found um, there's a company called Liquid Plastics that makes a material called Decathane, which is a UV stable clear coat that one of its key attributes is it looks permanently wet when it dries. And so we did samples where we took stucco and we put microparticles in it and then we sprayed it with decathane so it looked like plastic. And there wasn't enough of it to um, violate any fire codes. So that was our design. And that was within, well, it was about 35 bucks a square foot. And we presented that to Mr. Wiley and they dropped their jaw and they said, that's awful. <laughs> and I said, well, what's wrong with it? It's beautiful. It's like, it's gorgeous and super contemporary and wonderful. And Josh was really, really upset. And, um, and in the end, in their written formal comments, they said basically it did not subscribe to their idea of permanence. You know, permanence. I mean, in the end, the building functions because of an elastomeric waterproofing membrane and four inches of insulation. You know, everything on the outside, as I like to say, is completely sacrificial. It's our kind of Baroque problem that the rain screen, while it is functional, can look like anything. That's your crisis of formalism. It's like once you wrap the building up and it functions, like you could clatter whatever you want as long as it doesn't burn. So in the end, we're like, okay, well, give us some more money. And he said, fine. <laughs> <laughs> so they raised the budget. And uh, then we had like about 100 bucks a square foot for the wall. And then we were working on the new museum at the time. And the new museum has all these uh, four inch micro folded extrusions behind the main folded facade, which creates this kind of other layer of oscillation. And we said, Josh, let's, let's do clapboard siding extrusions. And then the idea of hanging the facade to get rid of those joints 
survived. And we said, let's take extrusions on the outside of the building and hang them from the top 90 feet. And we'll just splice them together. And then the idea of, uh, you know, I think Arez and um, there was an intern, I can't remember her name, but uh, she made the model where she basically stuck silver card and a bunch of acrylic pipes on the edge of the model. And we're all like, that's beautiful. Looks great. And then we scaled it and there were two feet diameter. We said, that's too big. So we made it down to 10 inches diameter. And then we started drawing these ridiculous lollipop kind of extrusions that look so absurd. Um, and, and I'll tell you, this is the real evolution. It's like, okay, you got a flat series of uh, uh, backing surfaces behind the circles. And the backing surface made it look terrible because it just looked like a bunch of tubes sitting in front of a flat wall. And so we started faking out the profiles of the back to make it look like there was more circles behind the circles. Isn't that totally bankrupt? You know, it's so ridiculous. So we did all that. And then eventually, from an engineering standpoint, we said, if these are going to be installed top down, 90 feet by 10 inches in a single unitized pipe, we don't want a subframe, right? So all we want is a horizontal rail every 16 feet on center across the building to take the wind load. And then what we did was we engineered the extrusions to take the cumulative load of 90 feet in tension. And then we engineered the I value of every extrusion for the tributary area of 10 inches of wind over 16 foot span. So there is not a single extra piece of aluminum weight in that facade than is required to resist wind. And then we bought it. So can you replicate that in school? No. Is it the exact answer? You tell me. Or, I mean, what is the well, I don't think it is. I mean, but, but, but what is architectural research? I think it is a problem. It's a real problem. <laughs> I mean, I, I have universities that call me up and say, we want to prototype a facade system with you, and we want you on as a kind of technical advisor. And I'm like, are you kidding? Forget it. It's like, you know, a uh, facade for what? Where, for whom, on what purpose? And we all know uh, if clients are the origin of everything, well, some clients might want something because it was proven, but more clients want something because it's unique. And so the process of kind of sequential iteration on ideas and principles, I think is what we should be teaching in schools. I think we should be teaching first principles, critical thinking across the board, if anything, I would spend 50% of the entire curriculum focusing on cultural history and teach everyone the genealogy of ideas throughout history. So you understand the dominant paradigm within which you're working right now and who rules in the world, who has power, who's spending money, and why. And then just start making architecture. Teaching waterproofing? I can't waste my time teaching waterproofing. It's half half. And, uh, what, what the Princeton kids are doing well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what kind of resources do you expect to be expecting from them? I mean, do you have some money? No. And uh, is there someone coming from you know a kind of broad knowledge of these sort of ideas, or do you expect them to have some technical knowledge? Well, I, I'd say some of the architects we've hired have extraordinarily little technical knowledge. <laughs> very, very little technical knowledge. Like, I mean, you know Princeton does like the four plus three, right? Well, some of those four-year people came in with a BA in comparative history or comparative literature. You know, and they're doing very well. Because, I mean, in some ways that the people who can also understand the complexity of clients and relationships and the flow of money. That's the other thing I emphasize in my office is that when people start talking to other players in the industry, uh, be very circumspect about what you say. Um, and if you do not understand how somebody makes their money, you just shut up. <laughs> no, really, I mean, is a guy coming into the office representing a new flooring tile because he owns a company? Is he an agent? Is he like a representative? What's his motivation in life? What are, well, on what terms are they compensated? You know, the same thing goes for like, if you're accountable to the owner representation of the Toledo Museum, 
what is the what is that person's goals? What are the metrics by which their performance is judged? You know, is it kicking your ass every day or is it a little bit more nuanced? It is. But understanding, you know, how people have situated themselves and, and how they function is really important to creating constructive, harmonious, and very productive relationships. And Princeton kids are good at that. Follow the money. <laughs> At the same time that there's pragmatism, there's also a, a clear aesthetic criteria, right? That uh, brings you to discard many of the options that are, I mean, there's a sense yeah. that uh, you're trying to achieve something. Absolutely. So. Yeah, no, I, I would also say that, um, no, I mean, for as a consultant, if, if I'm not, and my team is not uh, culturally conversant in uh, both architectural and technical history, and also current kind of, uh, you know, uh, let's just say current concerns or bodies of uh, aesthetic design, differentiation, whatever. I mean, uh, if we don't know that, then we're not able to talk intelligently at the table to contribute to that because. You know, if you sit there and work with Seijima and Nishizawa and you make sketch designs that look like it's suitable for a Gary building, you'll be escorted out the door very quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, so even when you're at the table, you're, you're, you're the, 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 the expectation that you fully get uh, the, the aesthetic constraints, but also the possibilities. Like even understanding, like if you're gonna work with, uh, oh, let's put out there, say Neil Denari, where's Neil going actually? Mm -hmm. It's not a question of where he's been, mm -hmm. but it's actually in both because, you know, uh, I've been in a lot of meetings where, you know, you sit with uh, your client and they sit there and they, you're, you're just talking about ideas and, and they say, oh, you know, that job that we did, you know, wherever. Mm -hmm. And, and if, if, you're, if you're not up to speed, 90% of the time you're like, no, 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 <laughs> no, don't know what, can you show me a picture? Oh, I know what you mean. But to, to be able to say, well, yeah, or yeah, I saw that being fabricated in somebody's shop in Germany last year, or uh, yeah, I visited that building while I was on travels here and here and here. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it's like your exposure and awareness of like things that are going on. You can't know everything, but you can know a lot. And as a collaborator, the more you know and the more you're aware, the more you kind of earn your place as a kind of respected, uh, you know, uh, collaborator to work with somebody. Otherwise, so it's, it's another layer of uh, pragmatism, or is no, it's not easy. It, it, can I jump in for a sec? I mean, we may we may discover at the end of this session that in fact uh, our research category is a bit of a lead balloon, and that we need to kind of uh, leave it by the side of the road. But uh, instead of pragmatism as a category, I'm wondering if it's uh, in a sense the culture of technology. I mean, the idea that technology is, is not uh, autonomous from architecture, but has its own independent culture that, um, you know, sometimes we forget about that in the sense that we tend to think of technology only technically. And it seems like a lot of the negotiations that you're doing between uh, fabricators and clients, architectures and clients, architects and fabricators, uh, involves a kind of culture of technology in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, at a... Uh slightly zoomed out scale, isn't architecture a technology? Uh, I mean, that would be one definition. I don't know that I would I say that that would be sufficient to understand all of our No, I'm, I'm just saying, because I mean, technology for me is, you know, it's just so all consuming. And every, uh, I wouldn't say every because, you know, I'm not that cognizant of certain kind of limits of uh, certain fields of technological investigation right now, like certain realms of physics and so forth. But often they're not, um, they're not entirely technical, are they? Mm -hmm. Like there's so many technologies that are not just about the right widget, but it's about a kind of, um, you know, there is cultural prejudice in technologies. That's right, yeah. No, like and it evolves like, and it has its own history. Like I'm sure the Japanese, the way they build elevators is not the way the Germans build elevators. Absolutely, yeah. Like we've yeah. seen this kind of 
the cultural or organizational differentiation. You know, I'm sure the way IBM builds advanced chips is not the way you know Intel does. Like I'm sure that there's there's fundamental principles that are the same, maybe, but but I think there's there's so much differentiation. Absolutely, and I think I mean just to, to kind of follow through, I think one of the things that you bring to the table, if we were to classify it under a kind of research, one of the things that we learn from uh, what you're doing is in fact this kind of culture of technology at a very detailed level of the of the kind of uh, fabrication and making, but also at the very high end of the, the type of aesthetic uh, aspirations that are built into it. Um, well, I think the other thing you, you, you come up against is, you know, of the moment, any given technology is dominant in a certain place at a certain time. You know, whether it's a, a certain kind of formwork for building high-rise apartments in one country is absolutely the way it's done. It should and never can be done another way. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's say you're an architect and you're designing something with a slightly different structural concept. Like, you, say you want to use bubble deck, uh, which is, you know, very common in parts of Austria and Germany and Switzerland and maybe Japan. But it's very, very uncommon here. So if you go and propose bubble deck uh, as an architect, you know, most contractors and structural engineers would be uh, very suspicious. Mm -hmm. You know, not to say that the technology doesn't work. It's just to say, is there an infrastructure there to support it regionally? Um, you know, and that, that can be extended to so many different things. So I think one of the things we are always asked to bring to the table is cultural and regional specificity in terms of available technology. Like people are saying, hey, you know, uh, even even on TVCC, the building that burned down, the zinc cladding, which absolutely is the best material for that building, because uh, it's the most corrosion resistant, was not available in China, because the major international producers of um, zinc sheet are either German or France, or French. And uh, I wasn't there, but I heard a story where somebody convinced CCTV that the Chinese invented zinc 5,000 years ago or something like that. And, but anyway, it wasn't the day though eventually was, you know, stainless steel will tea stain over time and painted aluminum was banal architecturally. So the idea that you have naturally weathered zinc as the most corrosive resistant material, it was the right choice. But these things are, yeah, on every single project we face these issues. It's just not easy. Well, I assume this discussion would lead, uh, lead us to a differentiation between technology and technique, but unfortunately we don't have time to uh, continue now. So thanks, uh, Mark, for... Uh, You're welcome. Sorry discussion. for being late again, but uh, thanks thank for, for sticking out. Thanks, Ben. Sorry, what's up? I'll be back. Oh, okay.